You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast for the Locked On Sports Atlanta. Grant McCauley, Jake Mastriani with you after game one of a three-game set against the Los Angeles Dodgers that I think pretty much played out in the way that you would expect when these two teams meet in an anything that can ha- anything can happen fashion. And we saw a lot happen in this particular game. Unfortunately, the Dodgers were able to stage a comeback, got all the offense they needed for an 8-6 victory over Charlie Morton and the Braves to take the opener of the three-game set. We're going to talk all about it, the performance of Morton, uh, what was going on with the Braves offense, and of course, get you set for game two on Tuesday. Before we do, though, I want to remind you to subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta right here on YouTube. Click the bell to get notified every time we drop a new episode. We try to bring as many of these to you as we can. So if you like the work, be sure to tell a friend. Go ahead, hit that like button as well. That won't hurt our feelings, even on a tough night for the Atlanta Braves. And of course, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast, because Jake has all kinds of great stuff for you all year long. Uh, Jake, I wish I had more great stuff to talk about on this particular game, but not only were we treated to a 40-minute weather delay, uh, but then the Braves came out to their fast start, as we have seen them do quite a few times this year. Unfortunately, the Dodgers had some different plans in the middle innings and later. Yeah, you come out and score four in the first inning, and you got your veteran on the mound and Charlie Morton. You feel pretty good about your chances, even against the Dodgers team that is really good right now. But to come back and then lose that one, this one hurts a little bit. Yeah, this one definitely stings. Let's jump inside the line score of this one. It was game number 47 for the Braves. They came in just like the Dodgers with 29 wins on the year, but we're just a half a percentage point or so ahead of the Dodgers for best record in the National League. Well, the Dodgers are the first team in the NL to get to 30 wins. They're now 30 and 19, eight runs, 12 hits, no errors, six men left on base for LA. Braves 29 and 18 on the year, six runs, nine hits, no errors, and five men left aboard. Evan Phillips picked up the win in relief as Gavin Stone started it for the Dodgers. He got knocked around. We'll talk about that, of course. Phillips, former Brave farmhand, now 1-0 and on the year. Charlie Morton now 5-4 and as he takes a loss in what was a very uneven and a very rough start as the night went on for him. He was kind of uh, punished by a couple of mistakes, and uh, the Dodgers they had a little batted ball luck on their side, and I'll get into that as well. Bruce Dark Gratterall, his third save of the year. Two hours, 54 minutes time of game, plus a 40-minute delay. 40,025 on hand at Truist Park, uh, or paid to see it at the very least, and it seemed like most of them were there. They were very vocal, and they were cheering the Braves on, hoping for one of those big-time comebacks was not to be on this night. Uh, I guess we can talk about the fast start for the Braves, which was uh, fueled by Ronald Acuna Jr., go figure. But Eddie Rosario's three-run homer early on, that staked Charlie Morton to a four-run lead. And you would think, Jake, that with a rookie pitcher for the Dodgers and Gavin Stone kind of on the ropes there early, with Morton on the mound, the Braves had kind of lined this thing up the way they wanted it. Yeah, like I said, couldn't have been you know a better start for the Braves, getting four runs early against a young starter who struggled in his only other big league appearance. And look, I'm not going to complain about the early runs. The Braves are the best team in baseball in doing it, but it feels like there's been a lot of these games here lately where, where they'll get those runs early, and it feels like, as you said, they have that starting pitcher on the ropes, and then you look up and that pitcher's still out there in the fifth, sixth inning. They were able finally to get to Stone again in the fifth inning and knock him out, but it just feels like they haven't been able to get that knockout blow there after that first barrage that they have in those early innings. And again, you know, not going to complain at all. This office game is not on the offense, but yeah, it just feels like it was another one of those games. And I feel like I've seen a lot of them lately where they, they get that punch early and they just can't get that knockout punch to really get that starting pitcher out of the game yeah. and break it open early. Yeah, and to kind of play off the, I guess, the fighter analogy, if you will, you don't want to let it go to the judges' decisions. You want to get that knockout at some point, especially when you get the early, the first-round knockdown, we'll call it all of that, and, and kind of leave it there. But the Braves, you know, they can do a little punch, counterpunch, and unfortunately, on this night, they weren't able to do quite as much as the Dodgers were as they got to Charlie Morton. A 4 nothing lead, as you mentioned, he gave up a solo home run in the second. I've said this, and I'll continue to say it. You can give up a couple of solo home runs, especially on a night the offense is clicking. That kind of thing is okay. But there was a three-run homer off the bat of her old friend Freddie Freeman that was really kind of the uh, the big blow against Charlie Morton after Freddie had sparked a rally in the fourth inning with a hustle double. The Dodgers scored twice there. That made it a one-run game. And then, of course, Freeman, his three-run homer in the fifth. Jake, I don't know if you looked it up, but um, expected batting average on the Freddie Freeman homer, 0-70. But it was a fair ball. It was a three-run homer. They all count, and who cares what was expected? The actuality is 
uh, that it put the Dodgers out in front. But it was that kind of night for Charlie Morton on top of everything else. Yeah, no, a little bit of tough luck in there, but still was not a great executed pitch by Charlie Morton at all. I mean, that pitch was left over the middle of the plate. It looked like Murphy was wanting it to go back down and away, which they had just gotten Freddie on that a couple of pitches before. But, you know, I thought Frank Cor made a great point. You throw a great hitter like Freddie Freeman, four straight curveballs, eventually he's going to get to one. So uh, I thought it was just, you know, maybe a bad pitch selection there, just bad execution as well. It came, came back over the middle of the plate and Freddie's a great hitter. But yeah, I did see that on Twitter and 07, the expected batting average on that one. And tough, little tough break for Charlie Morton there. Like you said, he gave up the solo home run to J.D. Martinez. You live with that. But first time all year, he's given up multiple home runs. And this was a big one, giving up that three-run homer to Freddie Freeman. Really flipped that yeah. game. It really did. I mean, and Freddie, again, was right at it. I mean, Charlie got him in the first inning for the punch out. Freddie got that nice ovation. He didn't get the called strike on him. The umpires let that whole thing play out. I thought that was a nice touch, mm-hmm. you know, letting the humans do the human being things during the game. And, you know, let the clock kind of start ticking once it was time for it to get back in. Freddie punched out on five pitches, and then it was pretty much Freddie Freeman's night from the for the rest of the evening against Charlie Morton. And that's a matchup that Freddie has really owned throughout his career. He has gotten to Charlie quite a few times, and he did it again on this night. The double that sparked the rally in the fourth inning, as I mentioned, hustling all the way, decided he wanted that double out of the box. And I think that Frank Gore made another good point on that broadcast as we were obviously listening to the same thing at the same time. The track was a little bit slower. The turf was thanks to that rain. So uh, that's just one of those things that, you know, just with a player that wants it that bad, you know, Freddie was able to get himself into second. He was brought home. And then the David Peralta triple, I don't know that you could have placed it any better up the line. And you have to place it pretty well to score J.D. Martinez from first base. He's not the fleetest of foot, but he was a very busy man in this game with a multi-home run contest. Final line on Charlie Morton was five innings, seven runs, or excuse me, seven hits in allowing six earned runs, a couple of walks, the five strikeouts, and as Jake mentioned, the two home runs for him. Again, stake to a a 4 nothing lead. You would hope that he was able to kind of give the Braves some length. I know that there's always that, you know, kind of woulda, coulda, shoulda with, you know, why did you send him back out there in the fifth? But with the position that the Braves bullpen has been in and and may be in for a while, you got to try to get some length out of your starting pitchers. And for Charlie Morton, you were hoping he could find his way through the fifth maybe quickly, and maybe even get you into the sixth inning. I know it was kind of a rough night for him in, in a lot of different ways, and clearly it didn't play out that way. But if you're kind of playing, you know, guess along with the manager at home, that would be the reason why, you know, you'd ride it out a little bit further like that. Uh, but it was just not to be for Charlie Morton on this night. We got a lot to talk about, or we have a lot to talk about, I should say, when it comes to the Braves offense, the fast start, and some of the contributions, and a couple of guys who were, you know, maybe struggling a little bit that we're going to talk about in this one as well. But I need to tell you, about our great sponsor, eBay Motors, as they are bringing you this episode of the Braves Postcast. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit, and it's the same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check. Stay in the game with eBay Motors, guaranteed fit, ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay, guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, and, of course, exclusions apply. Uh, So as we look at what happened for the Braves offensively, it seemed like it was going to be, as we mentioned, the... Uh, the recipe for success, Ronald Acuna Jr. with a double that got over the head of the center fielder. I don't think Ronald expected that ball to fall. It did. He made it to second. He'd come around to score. Uh, a little bit of fun later on for Ronald in the fifth inning as he was trying to get the Braves back in the game. A walk to Matt Olson. Ronald just takes off for third since they decided they'd shift around a little bit on the Dodgers infield. A heady play, but the Braves were just not able to get, as you said, Jake, I think the knockout blow they were looking for. They grounded into three double plays in this game. That short-circuited some rallies as well. Yeah, double plays have been a huge problem for the Braves this year. I don't know what you do about that necessarily other than to try to work on your launch angle and not hit the ball on the ground so much. But uh, it's just been, I mean, ridiculous the amount of double plays they've hit into this year. I know Austin Riley's on a record pace for what he's done, but really it's the entire team has hit into a lot of double plays this season. And that obviously hurt a lot of rallies because a lot of those were leadoff runners that you get on and you think you know Braves are going to start a rally and then the double play just kills it instantly but I mean again you put up four runs in the first inning uh, you expect that to be a a win in a game that you're going to end up scoring a lot of runs and the offense you know could get that knockout blow they had some opportunities late I never really felt like they didn't have an opportunity with their bats to come back and win this one like you said just a little bit of batted ball luck. Eddie Rosario hit scores oh, a couple of balls up yeah. the middle that he absolutely got robbed on. So, again, just a little bit of 
uh, batted ball luck didn't go their way as well. And I uh, just couldn't find those multi-run in- innings late in this game to get the comeback. Sean Murphy not tagging up at third on one of those balls hit by Eddie yeah. Rosario, cost the Braves a run as well. So, again, just Dodgers executed a little bit better in the big spots in this game than the Braves did, and ultimately that's what it came down to. Yeah, they did. And Eddie Rosario, you mentioned not just a three-run homer in this game, as I'm sure the Dodgers are probably already tired of seeing Eddie Rosario when these two teams match up, but he got him again in the first inning. There's two more Rockets you mentioned, one up the middle to short, which started a tough luck double play for Eddie, but the one that Sean Murphy was unable to tag on or didn't tag on, you know, that was a play that felt like it was going to loom large. You, you lose by two, so maybe it doesn't feel as bad as it would have in a one-run game, but I think Sean was out of the out of the moment for whatever reason. I don't know what would have gone on because I was not inside his head, but you could tell immediately he realized he had made a mistake there. A nice diving play in center field, though, to uh, to make that catch a 930 expected batting average on that liner from Eddie. He's been blistering the baseball for folks that have kind of been wondering, like, why is Eddie Rosario in the middle of the lineup? Well, for games like this where he hits you a big home run and hits another couple of rockets, just they did not fall in on this day. Speaking of guys who have been really hitting the ball well in the month of May, how about Marcelo Zuna? Two more hits in this one, knocked in a run, drew a walk as well, drew the ire of Will Smith, the Dodgers catcher, with that big backswing. I'm surprised more catchers haven't complained about that mm-hmm. because I think he's knocked a couple of guys loopy over the last you know year or two, especially with that big follow-through and finish that goes high into the side of the catcher's helmet. Will Smith was not very happy about that. Yeah, whatever your feelings are about the opposing team, maybe taking it a little bit you know, more personal than it was, that's still something that should not happen, I don't think, as much as it does. Yeah, it happens a lot for Marcelo Zuna. I mean, I, I get it. That's his swing. That's his swing path. But, yeah, I mean, it happens a lot. I'm not going to be surprised if it happens again in this series. And I, I don't know if this is over with. I mean, as often as yeah. he does that. But, you know, getting back to his play on the field – he's starting to give you a little bit of everything. You know, one of my criticisms of Ozuna is that he's just been so one dimensional. It's just been home run or bust. But now tonight you saw him go the other way twice for a couple of hits. You saw him take a walk. I mean, he's starting to do other little things that make you think, okay, he can be more productive in this lineup. So that's very encouraging to see. We'll see if it sticks. We've been kind of teased by him before with these hot streaks, but you know, now he's on a, you know, what, two, two and a half week, hot streak now here that he's had. I mean, the whole month of May, I guess you could say. So, uh, so, I mean, again, he's really showing improvement. But for me, it's just the fact that he's doing all the other little things. He's taking the ball the other way. He had that bloop RBI hit uh, the other way in a a couple of games ago. He's taking his walks. So he's starting to be more of a complete offensive player, and it's not just home run or bust. Yeah, Ozuna has more than doubled his walk rate from a year ago. And if you're looking for kind of what's been going on in the month of May, he's currently on a nine-game hitting streak, another multi-hit performance tonight, as you joked about yesterday. But, hey, it's kind of worth celebrating. He's up over 200 for the year and continues to rise. And he's on a 17-game on-base streak. So if you're looking for hitters that have been helping the Braves' cause in the month of May, Marcelo Ozuna's name has got to be up towards the top of that list. Uh, one guy who's been having a very tough time here in May and has kind of had – I feel like a weird start-stop kind of season with the stint on the injured list, with the scare with the knee. Uh, that, of course, would be Michael Harris, the second. 0 for 4 again today. Last six games, 0 for 22, Jake. No walks, six punch, excuse me, five punch-outs. A couple of them came in this game. Batting just 163 now in 2023. On base percentage, not altogether that much higher, though he is walking a little bit more this year than he was a year ago. I'm still in the camp that, you know, maybe you can give him a day here or there if it's against a tough lefty and you're just kind of trying to get him going. But, I don't know that there's any substitute for going out there and getting reps and hitting his way through it, especially because he's already missed significant time here early in the season. Yeah, and and it's tough because you hope it doesn't become a mental thing now where he's just struggling so much that he's getting into his own head. I'll give a little shameless plug here because on Tuesday's podcast, I'm going to do a deep dive into what's going on with Michael Harris and the struggles he's having, and it's really – Quite fascinating to look at because the stat cast numbers, they're all pretty much on par with where he was last year. And the strikeout rate is down. The mm-hmm. walk rate is down. It's really, you know, not to give it away, but he's just not getting to the sweet spot as much. He's just a little bit off with his contact. And whether that is just because of the timing and because of the slow start kind of up and down, I don't know. But I don't think he's far off. But now I just worry that it's getting into his head and he's, uh, you know, 
not just in, I want to say he's engaged, but I mean, you looked at it, some of the at-bats tonight and it just, he looked uncomfortable. He looked like somebody who was lost at the plate a little bit. And so you hope that's not getting to him again, just a quick glance at all the stat cast numbers. They're right on par with it where he was last season. I think he's just a tick off with his contact and, and how he's contacting the baseball. Yeah, and it may be, but I can tell you this, as far as players I've been around that are kind of wise beyond their years or just kind of have the high baseball aptitude and IQ, Michael Harris is near the top of the list, if not you know, toward the very top of the list, because he just does not seem to get too high or too low with the way that he plays. And that might sound like one of those old baseball cliches, because, hey, we do this every day. There's a new game tomorrow. You can't you know, beat yourself up about the day before. I do think he does a pretty good job of that, but again, an 0 for 22 slump, that's going to get the attention of anybody. They're well aware of what they're hitting or what they're not hitting. And for Michael, I, I really feel like, and, and you mentioned the StatCast data, he can't be too terribly far off, but it is tough to watch the results just not be there day after day as it starts to stack up for him. The Braves would like to see him get going. I think his defense is way too valuable in center field to start thinking about you know any other option that you might have out there. I feel like that would create more of a void than it would fix a problem for the Braves. But you know, maybe I just feel like he deserves a little bit more time and a little bit more of a leash uh, than some may. Now, one guy who's gotten a pretty long leash in terms of trying to figure it out has been A.J. Minter. He was called into an inning in this game where he was going to face Mookie Betts with an inherited runner as Joe Jimenez gave up a double to Miguel Rojas. Uh, just hit pause for a second. I thought Joe Jimenez looked pretty good in this one. Best fastball I've seen. Hung a slider, gave up a two-out double. Snit went to the bullpen. Minter came in. Gave up the single to Betts. I haven't been able to figure out A.J. Minter's real problem here from a stat cast perspective. It's not just a whole bunch of walks, but he is getting hit a little bit more on the four-seam fastball. But I would have thought that the cutter was his problem, but stat cast says it's not. But either way, whatever the case is, the results are not what you want for A.J. Another inning and a third gave up a solo home run to J.D. Martinez. Three hits, no walks, and a couple of strikeouts. But another tough outing for A.J. Minter, and these have really stacked up. Yeah, it is a questionable decision, I think, to bring in A.J. Minter there. Mookie's been better against lefties this year. And like you said, him and as the fastball velo has been up his last couple of outings, it's starting better. to get back to where it was last year. So I, I'm, I question not at least letting him and as get that at bat. But again, with Minter, for me, I, I think it has been the cutter, honestly. When it's over the plate, it's getting hit extremely yeah. hard. If he's getting it off the plate, he's getting those swings and misses then it can still be an effective pitch for him. And they had pounded Mookie Betts inside with four, three or four straight fastballs, and they decide to go with the cutter, and he doesn't get it in enough and leaves it over the plate, and Mookie's able to barrel it up for that base hit. So, yeah, Minter's a bit of an enigma this year. The Braves need him to be good. They need Joe Jimenez to be yep. good. They need, they need to be able to rely on Joe Jimenez yeah. to get Mookie Betts out in that situation. And you can see the confidence is just not there from Brian Snicker with him right now. So yeah. it's a difficult situation right now with those two who you expected to be two of your better setup guys in the bullpen. Yeah, and you're going to need these guys to, again, find the way to get back to the form they want to. I feel like Jimenez, it was progress tonight, and it's unfortunate that the two-out double kind of took the shine off of it, but a better outing, and hopefully he can continue to stack those. I know we were kind of having the same conversation not long ago about Kirby Yates. He has been far more good than bad uh, since the first, what, week or 10 days of the season. That's an important development for the Braves. They've just got to figure out ways to cover some important innings and in leverage situations with Rysel Iglesias back to let this bullpen start to kind of get its feet under him. Losing a couple of starting pitchers certainly didn't help out that cause, that's for sure. On the Dodgers side of things, while Gavin Stone was unable to pitch uh, and, and pick up his first win in the big leagues, Evan Phillips, the former Brave, picks that up. He's now 1-0 on the year. And speaking of former Braves, Freddie Freeman haunted his old team three for five, the three run homer against Charlie Morton, a couple of runs scored for him. And then JD Martinez, not a former brave four for five with two home runs on the night. And that's how the Dodgers were able to take this game eight to six and take a lead in this series. We'll talk about Tuesday where Spencer Strider takes the mound for the Braves. After I tell you about our new sponsor or our, our current sponsor. So rare as this episode of the Braves postcast is brought to you by, so rare, the revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. Unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, so rare managers truly own their fantasy experience, collecting, buying, selling, and competing with player cards against global opponents to win epic rewards. Win or lose, you still own your cards and there's no cost to play. Head to so rare.com slash locked on, draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win those rewards. That's so rare.com slash locked on to start playing today. 
We want to keep it kind of quick here, but we do need to talk about game two of the series. Spencer Strider, four and one for the Braves. Bobby Miller, number one pitching prospect for the Dodgers, just one and one with a five six five ERA in Triple A. But this is a kid who's got some pretty serious stuff. He makes his MLB debut for the Dodgers in game two, Jake. Yeah, a lot of strikeouts for him last year across AA and AAA. He hasn't had quite the same success this year, but a uh, big start for him, obviously, for the Dodgers going up against Spencer Strider. You know, it goes without saying the Braves need Spencer Strider to be Spencer Strider in this one. A little bit of a rough start for him his last time out, at least compared to his standards. So looking for him to uh, get back going and uh, get the Braves, hopefully, in a win column to even the series up. Yep, Braves would like to even it up behind Strider as he goes for his fifth one of the year, and Bobby Miller makes his major league debut, 7.20 p.m. Eastern time, the first pitch at Truist Park for the Braves and Dodgers in Game 2. A rough one on Monday for Atlanta, unable to hold on to an early lead as the Dodgers grab an 8-6 win over the Braves to open up this three-game series. We'll be back with you, though, as the series continues right here on the Braves Postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcasts. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time. And until then, so long, everyone.